Now, your hosts, Vicki Hyman and Aaron Medley. Hello, and welcome to Remote Possibilities. I am Aaron Medley, here with Vicki Hyman. Vicki, you're back from sunny L.A. I'm back from sunny L.A., almost recovered. Came back to a son and a husband who both had the flu. Ooh, that's nasty. It was nasty. <laughs> well, guys, uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, at Remote Podcast, at E underscore meds and at Vicky High, V I C K I H Y. And in case you were wondering, I'm still trying to get at Aaron Medley, but Twitter is not helping me. <laughs> like, how many months have I been trying to do this? And every well, how, are, how are you going about it? I go to them and I'm like, look, this Aaron Medley person has not tweeted since 2009. Mm-hmm. And oh, I didn't tell you the latest development is that when I first joined Twitter, apparently I had the name at Aaron Medley. Because I found, and I got rid of it and changed it to E underscore meds. Why? Why? I don't know. It's your own fault. (laughs) So at the end of the day, it is my fault. Um, On today's show, we are going to talk about Star, the new Queen Latifah drama on Fox. The young Pope starring, uh, what's his name? Jude Law. Jude Law. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) <laughs> the Apprentice and The OA, which I finally watched. Um, but before we get into that, let's talk about some TV news. So the Television Critics Association tour still happening, although Vicky's not there anymore. Yep. Uh, today is the last day. But some news has come out over the past few days. Uh, so yesterday it was revealed that Jerry Seinfeld has signed an exclusive deal with Netflix, bringing his Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee web series to the streaming network. Uh, he'll also do two stand-up comedy specials. Vicky, who is watching this Comedians in Cars with Coffee series? Comedians who, have, who own cars? I don't know. Um, I know I've, I've watched it a few times. It's cute. It's funny. Um, I, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we can say about it. It's no, cute I think, and it's no. funny. Are they going to expand it like half an hour each or so? I mean, like, is it going to be expanded to, I mean, what is it going to be? Well, I don't know, but they've ordered 24 episodes. Like, yeah. I didn't even know there were 24 comedians that of people would are. be. Of course there are. I mean, it's like, you know, it's it's the comedian version of um, Carpool Karaoke, I guess. I mean, there's they have some interesting conversations. I like the Stephen Colbert one, which I saw. Um you know, it's fun. People, you know, I love, I, I, I think it's interesting what Netflix is doing um, with the one day at a time being like this very um, a traditional sitcom. And then something like we're going to discuss later, like OA, something completely out there that they are really just like going to, they're trying to be just like a broadcast network and be broadly appealing, which is funny because I've always associated with like these sort of like high end edgy shows, but like they're doing everything. So and I think that is part of the problem. I had this conversation yesterday with someone who said that she really loves Netflix. And most of the shows that she watches are on Netflix, but also from Netflix. Mm-hmm. And I find that every time I log into my Netflix account, it's recommending some other show where I'm like, I who has time to watch all of this? Like, where are these shows coming from? Like, do we need that many programs? Like, I am overwhelmed. Well, I mean, there's a lot of discussion as to, like, when peak TV is going to actually peak because it's pretty unsustainable. But they're putting a lot of money into – a lot of people are putting a lot of money into programming, not sure if they're getting what they need to get out back. Um, So they're talking that maybe, like, this year or next year could actually be peak TV and then we're going to be seeing it sort of, you know, become more manageable again, which I'm kind of looking forward to and kind of sad because there's a lot of great stuff out there that you can find. I mean, Stranger Things, which Stranger Things have ever been made, had their, you know, had we not yeah. been on TV. So, of course, the OA got made too. So there you go. <laughs> and we will talk about the OA. Um, in other news, Reba McIntyre is eyeing a return to ABC uh, in a show that was created by Mark Cherry of Desperate Housewives fame. Okay. She will play a Southern sheriff who teams up with a Middle Eastern FBI agent. Oh, stop right now. Just stop. (laughs) But wait, there's more. To fight against horrific crimes in small town Kentucky. Is this a drama? Is this like, you know, I mean, Justified meets a sitcom? Like, what is this? I don't don't understand. What this is. Is this satire because Mark Cherry is involved? Like, what? 
it's probably going to be a mix of both. It's like, you remember Desperate Housewives? They were trying to tout that as a comedy, but the season premiere, I mean, the series premiere had someone committing suicide. So it's yeah. like, is it a comedy? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like the, the thing that the, the one word that turned me off was horrific crimes. And it's like, it's if they're really horrific, then it's really hard to be funny. Um, it's hard to be satirical about. But okay. That's true. We'll see. We'll I'm see. Sure a lot of fans out there. Hey, look, I like that show, Reba. I also love Reba McIntyre, so I can't... And I like Mark Cherry, um, who was a writer on Golden Girls, let's not forget. Uh, So um, I will definitely check it out. And it's on ABC, and you know I watch almost anything on ABC. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you can watch almost anything anywhere. That's that's your charm. (laughs) (laughs) That's my appeal. That's what I bring to the show. Um, Okay, and finally, and I know this is the news you've been waiting for... Donald Trump is going to sit down with Bill O'Reilly before the Super Bowl for a Q&A. It will air at 4 p.m. Who's doing uh, the Q and who's doing the A? <laughs> <laughs> it will air at 4 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday, February 5th, which is Super Bowl Sunday. So uh, this is the part that scared me. This is from TV Line. Additional segments from the sit-down which will be pre-taped at the White House earlier that day, to which I replied, but why are they at the White House? And then I remembered. That he's going to be president? Yeah. He's going to be president then? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Uh, it's, it, that, I think it's interesting they're pairing him with Bill O'Reilly. I mean, like, they can't pair him with Sean Hannity at this point because Hannity just became such a cheerleader during the campaign. And Bill O'Reilly, you know, while, of course, Bill O'Reilly is, you know, very supportive of, you know, the Republican conservative, you know, Everything. Line, line. Um, I think he was like more challenging to Trump than the hand they ever was. So, yeah. I mean, okay. look, I'm sure at first you think, well, Donald Trump and the Super Bowl don't go hand in hand. But if you think about Super Bowl fans, sure, I think they it's do. very it's all spectacle. Both of them, it's all spectacle. No, I think it's both spectacle and I think it will appeal to the people who voted for Trump. Like a lot of middle Americans love football, like it is America's sport. So I think it, look, it goes together. I will not be watching as I do not watch the Super Bowl in general. I only watch the halftime show. Let's be honest. Right? You're better than I am because I don't watch any of it. You don't even watch the commercials like the next day? No, I mean, no, I don't. I mean, like if there's one that, I mean, I, as long as I don't have to write about it, sometimes I have to write about it, in which case I do, but I try to stay far, far, far away from that. I'm like the anti Super Bowl programmer. Like, but Lady I'm, Gaga. I'm no, I, I don't care. I don't oh. care. I did watch Beyonce though. I enjoyed Beyonce's. I'm sorry. It was very good. So I don't watch the Super Bowl unless it's Beyonce. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. All right. That's fine. Okay. So moving on, let's talk about Star, which is the Fox drama starring Queen Latifah um, and some others who are less famous. (laughs) And should remain so. That's true. Although, um, um, what's his name? Um, Benjamin Benjamin Bratt. Bratt, Yes. Benjamin Bratt and Lenny Kravitz and Naomi Campbell also star. Oh my God. Yeah. Also star on star. Um, and it is about three young women who have big dreams of becoming, um, pop music sensations. They form a group, they, uh, move to Atlanta. They move in with Queen Latifah's Carlotta, who sort of serves as a mother figure and who herself was in a singing group with two of the girls mother. Right. Is that right? That's absolutely right. Okay. So that's Very the, good. thank you. The setup of the show that is absolutely terrible. Well, it's funny because I was at the TCA and they did the, they did the panel and it's like, it's almost like Stockholm syndrome when you're at TCA because they're talking about the show, like the shows that you've already seen that you didn't like, but they're talking about it so seriously. And it's like, yeah, yeah. But, but at one point it's from Lee Daniels who created empire. And at one point he talks about how um, his inspirations were dream girls, obviously, and the Valley of the dolls. And when he said the Valley of dolls, I was like, Oh, yeah, I guess I could sort of see that. I mean, sort of like ridiculous, over the top, pulpy. And I mean, it didn't make me really like it anymore, but it sort of explained a little more of the aesthetic and the storytelling. Um, but yeah, I'm not liking it really at all. Wait, so how it, many episodes have you watched? Um, I think I've watched three. Cause I, oh, I, see, I, that's, I think that's all there have okay. been is three. Yeah. yeah. So I watched the pilot and I, 
I think I told you, I was like, oh, they, before, I watched the pilot before you watched it. And I was like, Vicky, you're going to like, I really like the show. And you're like, no, I don't think I'm going to like it. And I was like, no, it was really good. I liked the pilot. I thought it was a little campy, a little over the top, but like in the best way possible. No, it was camping over the top in like the lifetime movie way possible, which didn't really mesh with anything else. I mean, okay. So in the, in the openings, in the opening scenes, um, the Jude Demarest plays um, the, uh, one of the singers who has like the most drive. But her name's Star. Star. Her name is Star. Oh. Ms. Jude Demarest is the actress. Right. right. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, I know, so, but I'm saying her name is Star. So, sure. she's a, so she has to go pick up her half sister um, who is in a foster home somewhere else. And she just sort of like walks into her foster sister's home, which she hasn't seen in a few years, and then walks up the stairs and discovers that her the foster father is, you know, raping her. Her. And let's be clear, the foster father is Eddie Winslow from Family Matters. I did not know that. Thank you. Does that give You're me welcome. That? Make it better or worse? I don't know. It makes it worse. <laughs> it makes it worse. Okay. worse. okay. So, so, so Star looks and like, I mean, she's a terrible actress. I'm sorry. She goes downstairs. She grabs a knife. She goes back in. Next thing you know, she is like psycho styling, st- stabbing the Family Matters guy to death. Um, it's 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 filmed in this just ridiculous over the top way, and then they take off for Atlanta with the uh, the third singer. I mean, it's just that, that's when it lost me. It just lost me right there. I mean, I was kind of laughing at the show, it which is so what made bad. it wonderful. No, no. If you just buy into the camp of that of that, but then but premiere. then have, I'm sorry, but like Queen Latifah is actually giving a good performance and like a. Duh a serious performance and basically trying to elevate material that refuses to be elevated basically. Um, and it's just, it's so all over the place. I mean, it like, is all over the em- place. at least with empire, the other Lee Daniels project, you know, it sort of maintains this sort of like high camp tone throughout. Um, it's just, this one is just, it's a mess. It's a mess. It is a mess. It needs more focus. I mean, you also left out that in the pilot we had the reveal that Two of the people were transgender, or no, one one person was transgendered in the salon owned by Queen Latifah's Carlotta, and it was her just daughter. like her it's daughter, yeah. yeah. And it's like, well, what does that have to do? And then they went to the strip club. Okay, it was all over the place. I yeah. can give you that. But it was still, for me, entertaining. Where it lost me was in the second episode, where they did this groove is in the heart um, music montage where there were like strobe lights and, and disco yeah, they're doing balls. They're and doing then, these like fantasy sequences. Correct. And I was just like, I'm not here for fantasy, fantasy sequences because in the pilot, the singing was integrated into the show in a way where it seemed plausible that people would be singing. Yeah, but I mean, e- even in the first episode, I think where um, um, Star sings for Benjamin Bratt in like the strip club, it it goes into a fantasy sequence that is like, I mean, it was over the top and ridiculous. It was, but but that's something that you would see on Empire. It seemed more realistic than this. You're going to be seeing in the heart a thing. lot of that. In no, Star- I'm not, and I'll tell you why because I'm not be watching, watching it. it. Although I have to say, at the TCA, they they premiered um, one of these sequences where you have Queen Latifah rapping, like old school rapping, and it's pretty awesome. And it's like. I'm kind of interested in Carlotta and Queen Latifah's character and dealing with her transgender daughter, you know, began as a son, now as a her daughter. Um, I, I kind of like that, but the, the the three young actresses are just, they're, they're bad. They're very I, bad. Look. Lenny Kravitz, I, Kravitz and Naomi Campbell are, are no prizes either, let me tell no. you. No. No, not good at all. At least um, Campbell is like, you know, she only acts one way, which is sort of like archly, you know, like like she's in a high-end soap. Lenny Kravitz, we've seen, can act, and he doesn't even know what he's doing in this. He does not there's know no what he's doing in this episode. Clear so. vision. There's no clear vision. What about in the in the second episode? I think I watched up to the part where Star potentially slept with Lenny Kravitz, unclear. Maybe she just took a bath in his room. I don't room. think so, but yeah, she's taking a bath. But that whole thing was bizarre where I'm like, she's supposed to be like a 17-year-old girl. Yeah. She's not of age because she was still in foster care or a ward of the state, and, they, and the woman just, oh, that happened in the pilot where Star was a ward of the state and the woman at the you know Children and Family Services office was kind of just like, ah, eh, it's all right, go ahead. Go free. Get here's, out of here's, my hair. Here's the name of your half sister. There, this is where she's staying. <laughs> Bye. Go. Bye. Um, I don't see. Okay, let me rephrase. I can see Star coming back for a second season, but that's it. Okay, 
I mean, I, I agree. I mean, it's 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 right after it's right after Empire because I watched all the screeners ahead of time, so I can't remember like exactly. Yeah, when. I think it's on yeah. Wednesday nights and it's after Empire. So I mean, it like I mean, Rosewood got a second season because it was on right after Empire. So there you go. So yeah. um, yeah, but it is not good. It's, it's very disappointing. Good. It is very disappointing. Um, but you know what else is not what else is not good? Empire. Empire's not good. I'm sorry. I know that is not the opinion of most people. I've said it since season one. I stopped watching midway through season two. It's it's just not that good of a show. Sorry. Don't apologize to me. <laughs> All right, moving on to another show. The that Young is not Bucks. very good. <laughs> I was actually looking at our lineup and I'm like, wow, I think this is the first time we're talking about just shows that are not good. Yes, but the last two shows that we're going to talk about, The Apprentice and The OA, I can appreciate. These other two, like Star, I can't appreciate. And The Young Pope, I, let me tell you what I don't want to watch. Okay. A talk show about, about Catholicism. But, but a show about, with fantasy sequences involving a pope. That's also very interesting. Um, I, was saying, I, I can appreciate certain things about The Young Pope. Okay, um, so tell us what The Young Pope is. Okay, The Young Pope is a um, drama starring Jude Law as a 47-year-old uh, pope, the first American pope, who uh, became the pope as sort of a um, compromise between the, you know, the liberal and... It actually, I think it was a compromise worked out by the liberal side of the church because they didn't want a very conservative pope being installed. So they picked this guy who not a, you don't really know very much about, bringing a whole new... Um, <laughs> meaning to the term the devil you know and the devil you don't. So basically they pick the devil they don't, and it turns out that Lenny Bellardo, who becomes Pope Pius XIII, um, is an extremely conservative pope who um, wants like basically total belief in God. He doesn't want any liberalization of the church, um, and he is fighting you know, battles on many fronts with different people inside the, the Vatican and, and winning pretty much because he's the pope. Well, yes. Yeah. Um, I I barely made it through the pilot, like the first hour. I know there are two hours available um, on HBO, but I was just not into it. The fantasy sequences didn't pull me in. The behind-the-scenes politics of the Vatican, I was just like, meh, not for me. The only thing this show has going for it, I think, is other than for people who are pretentious, because I think people who are pretentious will probably really like this show. Um, <laughs> Neither of us. Is that, is that it's beautiful to look at. I mean, there are, I mean, like, it is shot beautifully. It's very sumptuous. Um, and speaking of fantasy sequences, you're not going to see this until the fifth episode. But um, No, the, I'm not going to see okay, this. Okay, well, <laughs> the, the Italian director involved likes to use a lot of electronic music. And there is this um, wonderful sequence with um, uh, Sexy, Sexy and I Know It, where Jude Law is getting dressed in, like, all these, like, you know, beautiful elaborate vestments he's going to meet uh, with the College of Cardinals. And it's just, there are sequences that, that like that that you just sort of sit back and you can enjoy them. But like as a whole, again, sort of like messy and all over the place. And it is. Like, yeah. Wait, and is that Diane Keaton? Up, it, just for the sake of being proper, yes, that is Diane Keaton. Okay, yes. so Diane Keaton is in the show as a sister or a nun. As a nun. Um, and is that his mother? No, it's not his mother. Oh. Somebody else was asking me that yesterday. But it his seems mother, like um, that was the connection they were making. Well, well, she basically raised him at an orphanage along with another um, another person who is now a cardinal. So she's you know she's pretty good at, at mothering, I guess, mothering future cardinals. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, no, his uh, the whole Jude Law's whole psyche goes back to the oh, sorry Lenny Bellardo's psyche goes back to the fact that he was abandoned by his hippie parents. I think in Venice, you see a lot of flashbacks to him being abandoned. He ends up at the um, he ends up at the um, nunnery, I guess, the orphanage run by um, where Diane Keaton's character is, Sister Mary, and she raises him. Um, but the whole abandonment issue lies at the heart of like why he is the way he is, which is not terribly interesting. Not interesting at all. It is incredible. I mean, I, I'm sorry. You know, I nitpick. I'm such a nitpicker. But it's so incredibly unbelievable that Jude Law plays a guy who I think was the Archbishop of New York at one point. And th these cardinals are not going to pick somebody who they don't know anything about. And then you discover, I think in the second episode that there's no pictures that exist of Jude Law, who was the Archbishop of New York, because, you know, he wants people to see him as an emissary of God and like 
he shouldn't have like, you know, a public face or something. The marketing person for the Vatican is meeting with the Pope talking about, there's no pictures of you. We got to slap your face on some of these plates so we could sell, you know, we could sell plates and make some money for the Vatican coffers. And he's like, not having it. It's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. And as someone who went to Catholic school for 13 years, but is not Catholic, again, I don't need to watch a show about Catholicism. I'm sorry. This whole, the whole concept is just off-putting to me. Um, you know, but I don't even know if, like, it's even, like, that much about Catholicism. I mean, like, they, they throw around a lot of, like, words that, I'm sorry, do not really, as a Jewish person, do not really have a whole lot of meaning for me. But I'm, like, not even clear if they're talking about Catholicism. They're just talking about power. I mean, yeah. and in that sense, it's kind of interesting that this comes along with Donald Trump and the presidency where you have somebody who, you know, basically his word is law. Um, uh, you know, Jude he, law. Jude <laughs> It's like, it's like there, there are a lot of interesting parallels. So I think it's more about power than Catholicism. But there's this whole overlay of ideology and stuff like that, which I'm not really getting as a non-Catholic. And I'm not sure if it even, you know, if it's really meaningful to Catholics. I don't know. Yeah. I Look, I'm out. Is this a, a, a one-shot deal? Is this a special well, it, event series? Well, it's interesting because um, this is actually a joint um, project with, um, I think, maybe Sky, some European European um, producers, and they've already ordered a second season. It was very popular in Europe. Um, I, don't, I don't know if HBO is on board for a second season of this or not. I don't know. I can't Pass. imagine. Star. Yeah. Hard. Pass on the young pope. <laughs> Although I will say, in the first like five minutes, you do see Jude Law's behind. And I was down for that. You know, he wears those vestments very well. He looks he good. Is he is a good, good looking pope. Yes. I can tell you that. And he does not look forty-seven. How old is Jude Law? He I, has I, to be forty well, something. He's forty something. I'm sure. Yeah, um, but not forty-seven. Well, with him, as a person who's coming very close to forty-seven, I just don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's move on from the young pope and go to The Apprentice. Mm -hmm. uh, we are now in, it feels like the show has been on for months because they're burning off two episodes I know. per week. Did the show's going to be over that? by the first week of February. Did they used to do that? Two episodes a week? No, what they used to do was have one episode a week that was two hours. Oh, that's Now it. you're getting two hours, but it's actually two episodes. Actually, I appreciate this more because I don't like something that is dragged out. I mean, if, coming from Project Runway, I mean, it, it only needs to be an hour. So, you know, um, okay. Where, where, do, where do we even start? Okay, let's, let's save Arnold for a little bit. Okay, okay. let's just talk about the show for a minute because I have some mixed feelings about The Apprentice. I was actually a big fan from the very beginning of the show. Me too. Um, really enjoyed it. I never really got into the Celebrity Apprentice aspect until I had to start recapping it a few years ago. It was actually a very, very show to recap because it's just, you know, it's, it's just all laid out there. I mean, people's it's egos, it's just all there. You just write it up and stuff. Um, what I like about it is that um, what I like about a lot of other reality shows that are in my regular rotation, like Top Chef and somewhat Project Runway, where it's about people... It, it can be about people who do their jobs well. What I like about The Apprentice is when you see people who you didn't really have much of an opinion about, like being competent. Like when mm -hmm. Clay Aiken, like he's like he's a smart guy. I yeah. Mean, I had no real opinion about Clay Aiken before, other than he's a pretty good singer. But like you know, he knows how to deal with people. He is you know he was pretty respectful. He was smart. He put together the challenges well. And I, I like seeing that. And like this season, I'm kind of enjoying Lisa Leslie, who seems No. To Are you up. kidding me? I'm not kidding. Lisa Leslie, Carson Kressley. I thought he did a I very like Carson good job Kressley. with the Kawasaki commercial. And then, you know, and so I, I kind of enjoy seeing that. And then, you know, I do not get When you say Lisa Leslie, do you really mean Layla Ali? Because no, Lisa I, Leslie I, has not been doing a great job. No, no, I think I think she is a little bit in the background, but I think she has a good idea of um she's a good idea of like what's going wrong. Maybe she's not adding a lot, but she is speaking very well and she can see what's going wrong. And I appreciate I think that. But I do think Ali's doing a good job, too. Yes. I think Carson Kressley is doing a great job. Um, you know, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen this week's episode, but if you haven't watched it at this point, are you really going to? Uh, John Lovitz is gone. Yes. And, um, he was, you know, he's, he's sort of becoming, like, the not-quite-as-funny Gary Busey. Um, <laughs> like, just, like, not adding anything at all 
to the right. show except just sort of weird dance. It's a, a lot of talking. Like, yeah, a lot yeah. of time. But I will say that overall, I'm very disappointed in almost everyone in the cast, um, especially the women. And th- I need Brooke Burke Charvet oh my God. Last to like, either get fired or step it up. Can I use the D word on this podcast? What's the D word? Um, it's four letters. It oh, it ends with a K? Yes. No. Because I kept saying it over <laughs> and over again, like that David Charvet is such a bleep. I mean, my God, last night. In last night's episode, let me just Monday. say. Monday. Monday, Wait, I'm sorry. I, I watched it last, okay, yeah. I watched it last time. Okay. Sorry. Watching I was watching The Bachelor on Monday. Um oh. so on Monday night's episode, um it's a, uh, one of the episodes is about a Kawasaki commercial. They're trying to sell this particular Kawasaki to a wide variety of people. And so they're trying to pitch it a lot to women and their idea was having women, you know, in different they were going to have Brooke Brooke Burke Burke Charvet. Char- 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 on the motorcycle with her husband from Baywatch, David Sherman, David. behind mm-hmm. her, showing, you know, like a little, a, a little you know, uh, take on, you know, the man always driving, the woman's driving, ha, 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 fun to that. David Charvet is not having it. I'm not going to do it. That's not real life. I would never do that. Never, not going to do it. And so she sits behind him. And that was the one thing that they were really dinged for. Yes. And she kept on saying, we didn't lose this because of that photo. And it's like, well, actually, yeah. Yes, you yeah, did. did because because in, of that photo. in that challenge, Arnold Schwarzenegger said it was very close. And in fact, um, you know, I, I feel like did Kyle's, Kyle, who's the project manager, her charity actually received money from Kawasaki. Like, that's how close it was. Mm -hmm. And I completely agree that it was Brooke's photo that lost in the challenge, and she should have gone home. But also, she should have slapped her husband across the face because he was being ridiculous. Frankly, it was pretty humiliating, I think, for her. If I were her, I would just be horrified that this, like, made it on air. I'm like, I would have fired him and just hired a model. Agreed. I I mean, it was it was ridiculous. It was one of, like, the it was, I think it was one of the most embarrassing moments I've seen on the Celebrity Apprentice, and there have been many. <laughs> there have been many. I think it was so embarrassing that she wasn't, she didn't seem that embarrassed by it. Anyway. No. Um, so, um, yeah, the, she's terrible. The, the other thing was the, um, the MMA fighter, whose name I don't know and will never know. Shagel, um, Shag, Sha, something starts with a C-H that doesn't look like it should start with a C-H. Sure. Chael. Chael? Yeah, oh, yeah, that sounds familiar. And when he, when Carson Kressley suggested that Alaska, who I know from RuPaul's Drag Race, because mm-hmm. that's one of my favorite shows, um, that Alaska should be one of the people on the Kawasaki, and he's like, drag queen, like, they're not marketing to drag queens, like, drag queens don't ride motorcycles, this is not going to play well, when the whole point of the challenge was to challenge expectations and, like, I mean, step they have, outside they of the have, box. They have zombies in ads, they're not marketing to zombies, okay? Right. I mean, hello, I mean, like, yeah. He, yeah. Right. I think I think they were trying to like gear up for some sort of like showdown that just never happened. Like they were because Carson wasn't place. going to hear yeah. any of that. Like it was, I. This season is just not grabbing me. I'm not well, rooting for anyone, and I don't really like most of the contestants. See, to me, it seems like pretty typical Apprentice, where there's a few people who are capable who I enjoy watching. Um, the one thing that I that I always think about when I'm watching The Apprentice is like kind of how it is like the most soulless show on television because it is all about manipulating people into buying your product mm-hmm. and it's just kind of gross and I get the same feeling sometimes when I watch these things and when you know the the people that are coming on and they're selling you know and the, and the, the, the reps are like talking about their product you're basically listening to a commercial mm-hmm. I feel the same way like when, when I'm watching The Voice and they do and they're working with their um, mentors and the mentors tell them well this is how you sell you know over here stand over here and then like maybe like let a tear fall not a tear fall but like you know you know <laughs> drop to your knees and it's like I don't want to see that I you don't want to see how the sausage gets made I just want to see the magic and like when you show me this is what this is how you're manipulating me I don't like it and so mm. that is like my general issue overall with The Apprentice, which I will so watch. Can we talk about Arnold now? Okay, let's talk about Arnold. Uh, oh. You've been terminated. You're terminated, yeah. I should I say. No, Get to I, the choppa. Get to the choppa. <laughs> I mean, I have to say, one of the things that was enjoyable about watching The Celebrity Apprentice was Donald Trump. Because he would make the most bizarre pronouncements. He would come up with reasons for getting rid of people that made that no didn't sense. make any sense at all. And I, think, I think we mentioned this on a previous on a previous podcast that like there have been stories of, from from editors who worked on the show who said that they were scrambling to come up with footage to make his choice make sense. 
and they right. just wouldn't. I mean, like they like. I mean, it was so. What, so what you're saying is Arnold Schwarzenegger is too logical. Yes, for the absolutely. He's too logical. He's trying to. I'm like you can see him doing like little tricks that Donald would do. Like I think in the first episode, he's like, you know, ladies, I will not have the laughing or whatever he did. Yeah, he's trying to be hard. In here, I'm the this. governor. Yeah, and like no, it just it just it does not work for me. I don't think the show should have been rebooted. Quite frankly, I think Donald Trump is an integral part of the show, and I think in the interest of um, uh, pop culture and national security, he should stop being president and take over the Celebrity Apprentice again. Celebrity Apprentice needs you, Donald. Okay, that I can agree with. However, I will say that one of the one of the things that appealed to me when Donald Trump was the boss on The Apprentice was his two sidekicks. Like, I always felt they brought something to the table, whether it was George. the original apprentice, when it was George and Caroline. George Caroline, and Caroline. Caroline, one, Caroline, whatever. Caroline, Caroline. Caroline, George and Caroline, I really like them. And then even with the celebrity apprentice, when it was usually um, Ivanka and one of the, uh, Donald Jr., yeah. I think it was. Also, I Eric also, sometimes. and Eric sometimes, yeah. And I thought they brought a lot to the table. One of the problems with Arnold Schwarzenegger is that one of the people is always like some rotating person, so it's never consistent. And the other one is his cousin, who I don't even know who the heck he is. Like, what his are his nephew. qualifications? His nephew. His nephew, whatever. Yeah, Patrick Schwarzenegger. I, I don't know either. Um, also, it could have been the other Patrick Schwarzenegger, the hot one. Like, could we have had him on yeah. instead? <laughs> no, it's not him, but it should be. So, yeah, not not really adding anything to it. I do not like the rotating person. My husband's like, who is that woman? I'm like, I don't know who that woman is. I'm sorry. Right. And I watched the whole episode. I thought it was going to be, um, from the first episode, Tyra Banks the whole time or something. Like, there needs to be consistency that's not Patrick Schwarzenegger, non-hot Patrick Schwarzenegger. Well, I mean, the other thing with, like, George and Carolyn is that you really felt like, um, even though it's a ridiculous TV show, that these were serious people who were thinking seriously about these ridiculous things. Whereas I don't get the feeling that Patrick Schwarzenegger is really taking it too seriously. And he doesn't have the gravitas that no. George has. Bring back George. Bring back George, unless he's dead, because <laughs> he was kind of old. But you know what? what? They, they also kept, they kept the, the receptionist. <laughs> no, that's a different receptionist. No, I, know, I, know, I, know, I know it's a different receptionist, but the fact that oh. they still have one, oh, yeah. now she has like a, a, a laptop in front of her, but could still completely useless and still like too many shots of her just sitting there. I'm like, what but wait, is this? But wait, to make it even better, like final thoughts, and then we have to move on to the OA. But they are in like an abandoned warehouse in the middle of LA. Like, where are they? Have you okay. seen those outside shots? It's, I'm like, you the, couldn't get an office warehouse going? like next to where Hill's Kitchen is filmed. Like the what? other, <laughs> it's like on a studio lot somewhere. It's like this doesn't look anything like a real place. At least when The Apprentice was hosted by Donald Trump, it was in Trump Tower where they would shoot the scenes. And it actually looked like a building. Now, of yeah, course, the it was still a set. Never real to me. I have to say, the elevators always look really but fake. But they were, they okay. were real. But it was. I've just bought it a little more. I think that's the problem with this new Celebrity Apprentice. We're not buying it. Yeah. So there's that. You know what else? I'm not buying the ending of the OA, uh, <laughs> which I, I binge watched over the last like week or so. Uh, the OA is a streaming series on Netflix. Uh, about a woman. <laughs> it's so hard to explain. I'm waiting breathlessly to find out what it's about. It's about a woman who was missing for seven years. Before mm. she went missing, she was blind. And um, she explains throughout the eight episodes, eight episodes, right? Yes. Um, her story of how she got from point A to point B. There it is. I haven't spoiled anything. And that is the OA. Now, we will say, spoiler alert, if you have not watched the OA, you do not want to listen to the end of this podcast. You do not want to watch it either. But if you have watched the OA, let's discuss. So I will say this, Vicky. I did not hate the OA. I actually liked it. I was into it until the finale. I was in. Okay, I have to, I'm coming to you by, um, with, with less knowledge of the show because I only watched the first three episodes at which point I was like, I cannot do this. And by the way, just for some more background, um, and Netflix just dropped this. I mean, they didn't like do any, like we didn't know it was, and I think they announced it like maybe a year ago, but like it just showed up and then people were like weirdly into it. And I'm like, Oh, another stranger things. Maybe I got like, I'm excited mm-hmm. about it. Then I'm like, I was into the first episode. And then after mm-hmm. that pretty much lost me. Um, I stopped watching it in the third episode, read recaps, 
of four, five, six, seven, and then watched episode eight. Oh, so, so okay, okay. So everything I, I I will admit, and I did not write about it because I don't generally write about things that I only read recaps of. Yeah. Um, so take what I say with a grain of salt because I watched the finale, not having watched several episodes leading up to it. But it's ridiculous. Okay, so let's just well, well let's just talk about well, so many things. Ah! I liked the, I really enjoyed the story. I like the storytelling, how she gathers this group of misfits, you should, I would say, um, who all are connected to this school. I don't want to say they're all students at the school because they're not, but she gathers this five group of, group of misfits and she sort of tells them her story. And we're supposed to believe that, again, spoiler alert, that she was kidnapped by this mad scientist who's trying to figure out um, death and where people go because when she was a young girl in Russia, uh, As her we school find bus out 55 minutes into the first into episode. The first episode, her school bus careened off a bridge, and all of her class, she and her classmates, all died. But she um, went to this place, and she was brought back to life. Um, but she lost her sight. That was the compromise. Um, and then she goes from there and tells the rest of her story: how she was adopted by this American couple. Um, she was raised as a, a young blind child. Then when she was 21, she went to find her birth father in New York City. And then she was kidnapped by the mad scientist who's trying to figure out why people who have near-death experiences come back. And and then she finds out that like three other people are being held captive in his mine lair somewhere in the United States, uh, I think, in the United States. And then at one point they go to Cuba. Like there are like a lot of things happening. They went to Cuba? No. <laughs> They went to Cuba. I read that in the recap. I'm... Yes, they went to Cuba, where he kidnapped another woman. <laughs> and apparently I missed the entire arc of, well, almost the entire arc of um, the guy from The Night Of, Riz Ahmed. Riz Ahmed, which when he showed up as an FBI... Psychologist? He, he wasn't a psychologist. He's like a listener, is how he described himself, not, not necessarily a psychologist. When he showed up, I was like, oh, this show has something else for me to stay interested in. <laughs> Um, which I was. So the long story short is uh, the captive, the OA, uh, Prairie is her name. They, she figures out with her other captives that there are five movements, like a sequence of movements that they need to do in order to escape to another dimension. And that's how they're going to get out of captivity. Um, so they practice all of that. And with complete feeling or full feeling or whatever they call correct. it. Correct. They also realize yeah. that they can revive people from the dead um, with these movements. Like that's where it started to get a little... A little weird. Um, that yeah, was like a episode, little weird. <laughs> that was like episode six, five or six. Um, but at the end, the twist in the finale <laughs> is that um, that perhaps Prairie is crazy, and that she got everything uh, in the story she was telling from books that she has read, including the Iliad. You know, one of the people in her story, um, his name is Homer, mm -hmm. and so. You know, they realize, like, oh, maybe Prairie has a mental illness and she wasn't actually held maybe. captive for seven years. But, okay, and then the real kicker in the finale that people just cannot get over is that the whole thing led up to, like, a school shooting mm -hmm. where the five people that she told the five misfits she was telling the story to were able to, uh, like, prevent the school shooting by doing the five movements. Yeah, they're in, like, a big lunchroom and there's a school shooter there whose face we never see. Right. And the five people, like, like are looking at each other, and they just, like, break, basically break out into, like, interpretive The dance. hokey pokey. But, <laughs> like, yeah, I, like, I mean, it doing. is the weirdest thing I have seen in a very long time. And the school shooter is not as much, like, you know, like, taken under their spell as he's like, what the F is going on here? Right. He's Which so confused. He's to tackle him. Right. And that's then the school shooting is almost entirely, almost entirely avoided. But there is one shot that ends up shooting, shooting, shooting the away. <laughs> and she's and she may or may not die. We don't know. They like sort of left it open. Or even if she does die, if she's she not bring her crazy, back. she'll come back. And so, OK, so that whole ending was ridiculous. And people were really upset that um, they watched this, this, these eight episodes. And it turns out the woman's crazy. And none of what she said is real. I don't believe that. I do think that what she said is real, and I do think it actually happened, and here's why. In the finale, you see one of the, the misfits uh, go to Prairie's house. He finds the books under her bed. But you know what he also finds? Riz Ahmed. 
in her house in the middle of the night for what good reason? Like, why is he there? Did you see um, that part? I, I, I must have setting up a second season, maybe. I don't know. The FBI is going to kidnap her. I don't know. Right. So the, the theory is, is that the FBI is in on the whole thing. And they know about the experiments. And Riz Ahmed's character is just there to sort of, like, keep Prairie in check without her knowing. And that he possibly planted the books to make it look like she was crazy. Mm. Well, my feelings, I mean, like, a lot of people are actually upset about the school shooting because it is such a horrific act. Um, yes. And it seems kind of, like, like, tasteless to just, like, throw a school shooting in there as, like, a plot point. Um, when I was watching it, I was actually, have you ever read the book, um, A Prayer for Owen Meany by, um, John Irving? Are you asking me if I read a book? Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Duh. Okay. No. <laughs> it is one of my favorite books. It's one of my favorite books. And the whole book, and I don't really want to spoil the book for you, but it's about, um, um, somebody who is sort of chosen or feels that he is chosen for, um, to do something with his life. And then there are all these sort of like actions that he is taking these like sort of weird things that he does that nobody really understands why he's doing it. But at the end of the book, it's all for a very particular reason. And so I was like, I was actually were like, okay with it. Like she is with these kids and she's helped. I'm sorry. These, these, these misfits. Misfits. She's, these misfits. she's all helping them in some way. Um, and then at the end, they all work together for the greater good. And, and like, I'm actually okay with that. It's just so ridiculous looking. I mean, it's like you just can't take it seriously. <laughs> you cannot take it seriously. The movements are quite bizarre. And I will say that even if you have no interest in watching the OA, just Google the OA yeah, movement really. and you'll see what we mean. I mean, it's it's a little insane. Um, but that being said, in the school shooting to the side, because that was just dumb, um, I would watch a second season of the OA. Oh, my God. I really would. I liked it until the finale. I, okay. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Really, you've no, okay. I will say it. Like you have nothing better to watch than you episode. only watched like, three episodes. It was so pretentious and stupid. It I'm wasn't sorry. Stupid. <sighs> okay, it was stupid looking. Admit it was stupid looking. It was stupid it's looking. It's really hard to take seriously. It was really stupid looking when they started doing the movements. Agreed. It was, it was very hard to get away from that for me. I'm sorry. All right. It's like That's I could, fine. Yeah. I mean, like, I saw snippets here and there throughout, like, you know, I didn't completely skip those episodes in between. And it looked, I think, like, less ridiculous when they're, like, in the foggy terrarium jungle jail <laughs> thing that they're yes. in. But it's like, in, like, the, the finale was ridiculous. No, the finale, look, I agree with you on that. The finale was ridiculous. I think they were trying to set it up, though, for season two, which I think that they did. The school shooting was completely unnecessary. Could have lived without that. I mean, it, I just don't know why they did that. If you have opinions about the OA, <laughs> tweet us at Remote Podcast, at E underscore meds, and at Vicky High, V-I-C-K-I-H-Y. Before we sign our, off for today, some breaking news. Uh, Vicky, our, our friend... Sally Ann Salsano yes. just signed an overall deal with Viacom. Oh my so her company, 495 Productions, will be creating shows for MTV, BET, VH1, Spike, and CMT. So she's probably rolling in the dough. Let's get Sally oh. Ann back on the show. Oh, we can. Actually, they, they reached out to me about like another one of her projects recently. And I was like, well. Eh, and if you guys don't that. remember, <laughs> Sally Ann was the creator of Jersey Shore. She went on to create the mother-daughter experiment, which is when she came on our show, Disaster Date on MTV, Tattoos After Dark on Oxygen, Tool Academy on VH1. That was such a terrible <laughs> show. And one of my favorites, HGTV's Design Star, which I wish they would bring back. I wish they would. I wish they would. That's a good one, right? I like that show. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. Um, speaking of design, sorry, I know I said we were signing off. Are you watching Project Runway Junior? I know how you feel no, about kids on reality no. shows. Sorry, I am not. You're missing out. Is it good? Yes, it was good the last season. Uh, you know, I don't like kids. So. I know you do. <laughs> Except for your own. Except for my own. Theo, she loves you. And even then, even then. <laughs> well, that's no, good. Gonna... Like, like kid, kid versions of shows just do not appeal to me for whatever reason. Probably because of the fact I don't like children. <laughs> You're missing real talent here. That's all I'm saying. I, I do not deny that they are probably very talented children. But they're children. Mm. All right. Uh, that's going to do it for this episode of. Are we going to preview what we're talking about next week? Next week, 
Next week, we're going to talk about Riverdale, which is the new drama on CW, which many critics have been comparing to Twin Peaks. Vicky and I have both watched the pilot. I've watched an additional episode. How many have you watched, Vicky? I'm ab- I only watched the, the, ep- the, the, the pilot, but I'm definitely going to watch more. And like we all, Aaron and I also found out that we are both childhood Archie fanatics. We are. I yes, I love the Archie I, comics. I, I didn't know anybody else who loved the Archie comics when I was growing up. I mean, I remember when they were in the, the checkout line at the supermarket and they were like the little digest size and I would ask my mom to buy them and she would. I so actually got them when they were regular comic book size. Oh, wow. Well. We will talk about all of that uh, next week and uh, we will be back then. <laughs>